Right, so where we left off before the break was uh, we we're looking at the air that's in this room. And we we're discussing the composition of the air in this room. You remember that it's composed of various gases, nitrogen about 78 percent, oxygen about 21 percent, and then carbon dioxide a very low percentage, 0.04 percent. Now the thing that's really interesting about gas and both gases that are in the air is each of the gases each gas is going to exert its own pressure so each gas is going to exert its own pressure so when we look at the total the nitrogen exerts a pressure the oxygen exerts a pressure and the co2 exerts a pressure collectively all of those gases add together give you the total pressure of the air. The way that we calculate how much pressure an individual gas is going to exert on the total, or how much it exerts, is based off of the percentage of the gas in the composition. So it's based off of the gas, the uh, percentage of the gas that's present. So in the room right now, and I didn't check, but I'm going to tell you the pressure here in Cleveland, Georgia doesn't really change that much. We can measure pressure in a unit called millimeters of mercury. And the idea of millimeters of mercury is if I take a U-shaped column, something that looks sort of like this, and don't be a hater on my artwork, and I can put in mercury inside of this tube. The pressure or the gas is going to set down, remember it's matter, so it has mass, and it will set down on that, on that mercury and pushes down on the mercury. And that force is translated around the tube, and then this side of the tube is actually going to rise up or it will be drop down, increase or drop down depending, depending on how much pressure is there. Okay? So if it goes up, that means there's higher pressure. If the mer mercury level drops down, that means there's lower pressure. So it pushes on that column of mercury to cause that, that column of mercury to change its level. That part of the tube over here is actually going to be uh, calibrated, and we would calibrate being something like millimeters of mercury. Okay? Now, I've just given you the way that we quantify what's called barometric pressure. And that barometric pressure is dependent upon the gases that are present and how much of that gas is present in the air at the location of that device. So here in Cleveland, Georgia, pressure exerted by the atmosphere is about 760 millimeters of mercury. That's basically anywhere from sea level up to about 5,000 feet. It's roughly going to be about 760 millimeters of mercury. Over on this figure here, you're using a slightly different um, measure of a uh, uh, quantity. It's called a kilopascal. Don't really get caught up on the, the unit of measure there, but take a look at the raw numbers. 101, 31, and 0. So as I move away from the surface or sea level, what happens to pressure? Decreases. We're going from 101 to 0. Now why is it decreasing? So it's going to be the total gas content that changes. Remember, gas is matter, or oxygen is matter, and matter always has mass, right? If I take one of your mugs, sorry, I'm going to destroy your mug. Throw it out the window, what happens to your mug? What's that? Hey, why does it shatter? Because it goes down to the ground, right? Why doesn't it go up? Because gravity is pulling it down. Gravity always affects matter, including these gases. So all of the gases that are out here in our atmosphere are continually being pulled down towards the surface of the Earth. So that causes these gases to build up 
near the surface and to be much thinner or less content out here further away in the atmosphere. Because those gases are matter and they're being pulled by gravity towards the center of the Earth. So they build up down here. And so we have much higher pressure because we just have more gas that's there, more molecules of, the, of those three gases located near the surface and it gets thinner or less quantity further away. So right here, about 760 millimeters of mercury, and you can say plus or minus about 10 millimeters of mercury can still be within that range. And that 10 millimeters of mercury, that change is tiny. It's not really that big of a deal compared to what we're going to begin to talk about, and that's moving here in and out of the lungs. We can change the pressure in our lungs by a much greater amount than just 10 millimeters of mercury. So if I have a total of 700 millimeters of mercury, and I've already given you that each gas exerts its own pressure, and it's based on the percentage of the gas present, we can actually calculate, do a little math, and calculate the amount of pressure that oxygen exerts, and the amount of pressure that the nitrogen exerts. And it's all based off of the percentage. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at, as an, at an example of the oxygen. So does anyone remember how much oxygen there was? 21%. Going to convert it into a decimal form. That just means I moved the decimal over uh, two to the two to the left. So 0.21. I'm going to take that. That's my 21%. I'm going to multiply it by my 760. If I pull out a calculator and do that, I've already done a touring, so don't worry about that. This is going to be 160, and it's going to be 160 millimeters of mercury. So, in other words, if I go back over here to my apparatus, the column of mercury is going to increase 160 millimeters. We all understand a millimeter, it's a distance. It's going to travel 160 millimeters because of the oxygen that's present in the system. We can calculate it out for nitrogen, so we just take 0.78 times the 760. And that's going to tell us how many, how many millimeters of mercury we should expect that column to, to increase because of the presence of the nitrogen. The carbon dioxide is 0 0.04, so it's actually going to be 0 0.0004 times the 760 to calculate the uh, gas percentage, the pressure exerted by that percentage of gas in the total. So the 160 millimeters of mercury is a part of the 760. So we're actually going to determine or, or, or uh, call that a partial pressure. We're going to denote it as a partial pressure. Okay, so partial pressure. So oxygen exerts its own partial pressure. And whenever we deal with partial pressures, we use a variable called P. Okay, so P represents the partial pressure, and then I got to designate the specific gas that I'm talking about. So for partial pressure of oxygen, we just put it in as PO2. Right? So you would read this unit right here as the partial pressure of oxygen. And what is the partial pressure of oxygen assuming a 760 millimeter mercury total pressure? 160, what we just calculated. All right, so the partial pressure of oxygen in this room is about 160 millimeters. Now, this is where it gets kind of crazy. Gases will actually diffuse not based off of total pressure, but based off of their partial pressures. We call it a partial pressure gradient, which is what is going to dictate how a gas will diffuse from one location to another location. Okay? So let me give you a little example here. So over here, I'm going to put in a barrier, okay? And this is just to help me represent that I have a location A and I have a location B. 
Now, let's put in some gases in, this, in these two different locations. Let's say that my partial pressure, well first let's put in a total pressure. And let's say total pressure over here is like a thousand. And it doesn't matter the units, we'll just call it a thousand. And let's say over here is 500. So before I put in any partial pressures, you would predict gases to move in what direction? From A to B or from B to A? A to B because we're going from high pressure to low pressure. So you would predict that arrow right there. Now, let's take a look at some composition, and let's say that over here, that's actually a thousand for nitrogen, and zero from oxygen. And over here, it's something like five from nitrogen, and it is 495 from oxygen. Now, I just told you that gas is always moving based off of the partial pressure. So, what does that mean about this arrow? This arrow basically becomes irrelevant. We can't use that for anything. Because it's not based off of the total pressure, it's based off of the partial pressures. So, how is nitrogen going to A to B. So, the arrow was correct for nitrogen, but what about the oxygen? Oxygen is actually going to move from B to A. And that's why it's crazy, because this really seems like it's going against a pretty substantial force. So the total pressure is irrelevant. It becomes a matter of how the oxygen, or how the partial pressure is going to determine that the oxygen or the nitrogen moves. Okay? Does that make sense? So you've got to look at the partial pressures. So already, what do we know about oxygen movement from the environment to ourselves? Because this is A and B now. A is out here in the environment, B is in our cells. We already know that oxygen is going to move from the external environment at 21% to our cells. So what do our cells' partial pressure have to be? Lower than 21%. And really what it is, is it's constantly tending to zero. Because at the very end of cellular respiration, we have a chemical reaction where we take oxygen and we convert it into water, and so it's no longer oxygen. Oxygen becomes water, it's no longer oxygen, it's water. So in your cells, oxygen levels are always being depleted. Out here, they're constant, 21%, unless you go higher, and then obviously, well, 21% doesn't really change, but the uh, partial pressure is going to actually decrease. So we'll go from 160 towards zero as we get higher and higher. Okay. So down here, 160 millimeters of mercury out here in the environment, zero inside of your cells. You can already tell that when oxygen is breathed into the lungs, it has the propensity to go to the cells because of its partial pressure. All right, so let's take this idea of partial pressure and let's begin to... begin to apply it to external respiration. Real quick, what is external respiration? So we've already talked about ventilation, right? What was ventilation? So ventilation is air from the external environment to the alveoli of the lung. External re re respiration is going to be movement of gases over that two cell layer from the alveoli to the bloodstream or from the bloodstream back to the alveoli. So that is your external respiration. So we're going from air to blood. And it's really the air that we breathe in. Now, what we need to know about the air here is the air that is in the lungs I'm going to call it O. And that's because we're basically going to be starting from that, in the ventilatory cycle, the respiration cycle, at that thing called the rest phase. So that air has already gone through external, respir uh, external respiration. It's already gone through exchange. Okay? So that's the point that we're going to start with, is 
the air is old, it's already gone through exchange. So the air that's in the alveoli before we bring another breath in, what's, it comp what's its composition going to look like in terms of gases? Where's the oxygen go? Breathe in a gulp of air, where's that oxygen go? It goes into the blood, right? It goes to the blood to circulate to the cells. So the oxygen in this old air, after you breathe it in, it goes through gas exchange, oxygen is going to be higher low. It's going to be low because it's being extracted into the blood. What about the CO2? Hot. Because CO2 actually goes in the opposite direction. Because in our cells, we're constantly making CO2, which is increasing the partial pressure of CO2. And we move it out to a very low CO2 level out here in the environment. Right? And now it makes sense why there's no CO2 out here in the environment, why it's 0.04% versus the 21% for oxygen. Because we need to move it in this direction from where it's being produced in the cell out here in the environment. Okay, so CO2 levels are actually going to be relatively high in this old air. Oxygen is depleted, CO2 levels are high. So that's where we're going to be starting from. So if we take a look at the composition of that old air, which again means simply that it's already participated. Oh, I didn't come close to starting that, right? Oops. So it's already participated in gas exchange. And so if we were just to take a little sample of that air out of our lungs, already participated in exchange, we would find that our PO2 equals 104 <coughs> millimeters of mercury. Our PCO2 equals 40 millimeters of mercury. 104 for oxygen, 40 for PCO2. Now, I take a, a breath of air in, so I ventilate. And I induce oxygen and carbon dioxide exchange. From the oxygen exchange, what's going to be happening? What is PO2 out here in the environment? Give me the number. 160. What is it out here before I breathe in, in my lungs, in the alveoli? That's what I've given you there. 104. 160, 104. Air is going to come, or oxygen rather, is going to come into the alveoli. It's now going to increase this 104, I didn't mean to cross that out, <laughs> that 104, it's going to increase it towards 160. That's going to cause oxygen to begin to flow from that LOV line towards the blood. Why? The blood, as we're going to find out, has to be lower speed. So we're, really the big thing that happens on the oxygen side of things, here's our 104 down here. In the tissue, it's 20. 104 down to 20, we're always going to be going towards the cell for oxygen. And we're going to be going away from the cell towards the environment for carbon dioxide. That's like the big take-home picture. If you remember that, regardless of the numbers, the numbers could be a billion and one. But as long as you remember CO2 goes from the environment to the cell, and CO2 goes from the cell to the environment, you will understand how the respiratory system works in each of these three different stages that we're going to talk about. Inter external, internal, and cellular respiration. CO2 is always going in. CO I'm sorry, O2 is always going in. CO2 is always going in. So oxygen exchange. I've moved the air into the alveoli. And this is actually the O2 coming in, as you breathe in, it projects deeper into the alveoli. What's going to happen next? Alveoli to blood. 
the blood circulates to the tissue and will go through the fluid surrounding the tissue and then into the tissue where it's going to be picked up by a cell to be utilized. Okay, so I'm going to give me the CO2 exchange. I breathe the air in. Air begins to fill through these passages. I got the old air down in the alveoli. CO2 is going to begin to move alveoli to air to come up. So that's what happens when we ventilate. You move air in that's not old out here in the environment to the air that is old in here in the alveoli. The oxygen comes in and as it makes its way into the upper portions of the lung, we have exchange of the air that we brought in to the air that's sitting in the alveoli. And we have exchange that occurs there in ventilation. Okay? By the way, I'm a trick question. Air that I breathe out. Tell me about the composition in terms of oxygen and CO2. High or low for CO2? High. Because I just had that LOV live to the air that I'm ventilating out. I want oxygen. High or low? Low, because I breathe it in, it's got 160 there. So right here, 160 down in the LOV line, 104 has that propensity to flow into the LOV line. And so when I breathe this out, leaving the other stuff down here, we know that it's low oxygen, high CO2. All right, now, if we take a look at blood circulation, You have blood that's circulating to the LOV line. So we have blood that's coming up through here, and then it's going to come back down here. This is the pulmonary circuit. This is your general circuit or your systemic circuit. Okay? So blood flows in. Now, that blood is going to have high or low CO2. Remember, CO2 always goes in this direction. CO2 becomes high, so we got high CO2. How about oxygen? Oxygen always goes in this direction. <coughs> so oxygen is being extracted, so low oxygen is becoming. Okay? So across the LOV line in the blood here, high CO2, low CO2, high oxygen, low oxygen. Now, why is the oxygen low in the CO2 or in the blood coming back to the lungs. Well it's because that blood has interacted with the tissue. So it's interacting with the tissue and the oxygen has been pulled out or it has been extracted from the blood. So O2 goes to the tissue, CO2, my carbon dioxide, goes to the blood. This is in the tissue, right? So CO2 comes out of the tissue into the blood. Now, the blood circulates back through the heart and then comes up into the lungs. And what we're going to find is the blood, as it comes into interaction with the alveoli, you have a PO2 of about 40 millimeters of mercury and a PCO2 of about 45 millimeters of mercury. So a PO2 of 40 millimeters of mercury, a PCO2 of about 45 millimeters of mercury. Now notice that in my alveoli, right, I just breathe in, I have new air that's come in, I have the old air that's in the alveoli, there's that exchange that goes on there, 
protein comes in, CMSV goes out. So I've reloaded the alveolar pair with PO2, and I've removed the CO2. It was 104 in the alveoli for PO2. It's now 40 in the blood. 104 will go to 40. So oxygen will move down its partial pressure gradient into the bloodstream. CO2 is going to go in the opposite direction. You basically all have now the ability to understand how gas exchange exchanges across every level of respiration. If you want a really good, like, one picture to remember for the whole process, this is it. You have your air, which is going to have a high oxygen and a low CO2, and then you have your tissue down here, which is going to have a low O2 and a high CO2. On the oxygen side, oxygen always moves in that direction. On the CO2 side, CO2 always moves in that direction. That is the basis for this figure right here. I just got rid of all the other stuff that's in there and simplified it for you. So now I can ask you, okay, I'm in, the, I'm in a capillary. How is oxygen going to move from the capillary towards the cell? So I'm in the blood in the capillary. How is oxygen going to move in reference to the cell? Always in, right? Because we always go O2 away from the air towards the tissue. Okay, so the blood circulates back to the LV line and it has these characteristics 40 and 45. You can look and you can actually see the partial pressure gradients 104 to 40 for PO2, 45 to 40 for PCO2. So as the blood interacts with the alveoli, how will the oxygen move? So alveoli in the blood. How is oxygen moving? Alveoli in blood. What alveoli? It's not rhetorical. Is that or the alveoli closer to the tissue or closer to the air than the blood of the <coughs> capillary? Closer to the air. It's going to go to the blood. So oxygen goes to the blood. You can also look up here on this figure, and you'll see that we have 104 to 40. We always go from the higher number to the lower number. Okay, how about the CO2? CO2 here in the blood versus the LOPY. Air is up here, tissue is down here. CO2 always moves up, so it's going to go to the alveoli. Now, as we move away from our pulmonary circuit, as we move the blood back towards the heart, my PO2, as we enter into the lungs, is 40. As I leave, it's gone through gas exchange, and so now it's been loaded with oxygen, and so now I'm at 104. I've basically equalized with the pressure, partial pressure of the LV line. CO2 was 45 coming in. I've equalized to the pressure of 40 with the alveoli. So the blood, as it leaves the lungs, PO2 is 104, PCO2 is 40. So as we leave the alveoli, PO2 104, PCO2 is 40.
Now what you will notice is as I circulate through, I really don't lose any CO2, but as I go through the heart, I lose a little bit because that oxygen is being delivered to the heart. And so as we leave from the heart, our PO2 has dropped just a little bit under about 95. So that's going to be my external respiration. What's, what's the type of respiration I have where I have gas exchange between the tissue capillaries and the tissue? Internal. So let's take a look real quick at internal respiration. So drops just a little bit, 95 to 100. I'm going to use 100 here. So PO2 drops just a little bit from 104, which we had up here in the alveoli. So now entering into the capillary bed, the tissue bed, 100 millimeters of mercury here. The PCO2, we're going to call 46. Anywhere from 40 to 46, because it's actually 40 to 46 up here in the LOV line. So PCO2, PO2 is 100, and PCO2 is 46 millimeters of mercury. So now, the system here, you have the blood, the interstitial fluid, and then the cells or the tissue, right? So I have basically three different compartments. The blood, the interstitial fluid, and then the tissue. The interstitial fluid, or that tissue fluid, is constantly delivering oxygen to the tissue. So from here, oxygen is constantly being pulled from the interstitial fluid right here to the tissue, the cells themselves. All right? So what is that? The interstitial. I N T E R S T I A L. Sorry. Interstitial. Yeah, it is. Just in case you can't read it. Interstitial. Holy cow. I'm four years old. <laughs> So interstitial fluid is constantly delivering oxygen to the tissue. And the reason that we have that drive to deliver oxygen into this tissue is because the cells, the tissue, is metabolizing the oxygen. And that oxygen is converted into water. And so it's no longer oxygen, which is very important. Even though H2O has oxygen in it, water is not oxygen. So water is continually increasing in the cell, oxygen is continually decreasing in the cell. The cells are also producing carbon dioxide. Now note that the production of carbon dioxide means that CO2 is constantly increasing in the cell but it's not associated with the conversion of oxygen into water. It's coming from a different part of the metabolic pathway. Okay? So oxygen levels are constantly dropping. CO2 levels are constantly increasing in the tissue and in the tissue fluid, the interstitial fluid. Now, because of this, the fluid constantly delivers oxygen 
into the tissue. So the PO2 is 40 millimeters of mercury and always being decreased, always being pulled down towards zero. In the fluid, the PCO2 is 46 and always increasing. Because CO2 is constantly being produced by the tissue. So it's at 46 and always going up, always tending towards a higher value. So now, in terms of oxygen from the interstitial fluid to the cells themselves, oxygen always is going to be pushed into the tissue because oxygen is constantly being reduced in the tissue from interstitial fluid to the cells themselves or the tissue. The carbon dioxide increasing in the tissue inside of the cells, so it will want to go out to the blood. So constantly is pushed out towards the blood. And that's the gist of the rest of the respiratory process. The only thing we haven't talked about is how the oxygen and the carbon dioxide are carried within the blood. We know each point of exchange along the way and it's all based off of the partial pressure. So if I were to reverse partial pressure and like make partial pressure here higher than 160 in the capillary, oxygen would begin to flow out. That doesn't happen because the physiological norm is for oxygen to circulate through and constantly be pulled into the cells to be converted into water. So again, you have that constant pull of oxygen from the air to the tissue, CO2 is produced constantly in the tissue, and it's constantly pushed out to the air because of the low concentration. Does that make sense? Does everybody feel relatively comfortable with that? Don't overthink it because it's really not that hard other than some of the physics stuff with partial pressures and keeping track of those and keeping track of the numbers. The general idea is CO2 goes this way, PO2 or oxygen, I should say, goes this way. Carbon dioxide in, oxygen out. Now let's talk about what actually is happening in the bloodstream with the oxygen. Yes. I did. Is that was wrong. That was wrong. Did I really? CO two goes out. Oxygen goes in. I'll have to review the tape. <laughs> Throw a flag on that one. Okay, let's talk about, I apologize, I'm not perfect, it's pretty great. So let's talk about oxygen and CO2 carried in the blood. So you're not inside of a capillary bed, you're not inside of the capillaries of the alveoli or the lungs, you're in an artery circulating through the circulatory system. If you're an oxygen molecule, you're not just inside of the blood, you're actually going to be attached to you're going to be attached to another molecule. So once oxygen enters the bloodstream, it's going to be transported, associated to a protein called the hemoglobin. I find all of my hemoglobin inside of the red blood cell. So as oxygen comes in from the alveoli to the blood, it spends a very short amount of time traveling through the blood, through the membrane of the red blood cell, and then associates with the hemoglobin. So that protein picks it up. Now the reason the protein can pick it up is because there's two different parts of this protein. The first part is the heme group. And if you're up on minerals, you'll know that heme is associated with a mineral called iron. Okay. So iron is found inside of this particular molecule called hemoglobin associated with this part of the molecule called the heme group. And it's that heme group, that iron containing group, that carries the oxygen. 
So really, the oxygen comes in, spends a short amount of time in the blood itself, goes through the membrane of the red blood cell, and then attaches to that iron heart. The globin is just simply the fact that the protein is a protonation structure that holds the heme group that then holds the oxygen. 98% of your oxygen is carried this way, associated with the hemoglobin. The other 2% is what's being transported between the LOV line and the um, hemoglobin or from the hemoglobin into the tissue support. And that's just simply through the blood plasma, the water component of, of the blood. Alright, so the blood plasma we're also going to find a small amount of oxygen there and it just is simply dissolved so individual molecules of oxygen dissolved in the water, that watery plasma. And again, those are just the little tiny molecules of oxygen that are making their way towards the making their way towards the hemoglobin to associate with the hemoglobin or making their way from the hemoglobin to the tissue to utilize in cellular respiration. So maybe two percent. So when we look at the exchange, the exchange from the LV light to the blood actually occurs not with the hemoglobin, but with the plasma initially. And then we see the same thing down in the tissue bed as well. So exchange occurs between the tissue or with the lungs and that watery component of the blood called the plasma. But once we've transported oxygen into that watery component, 98% of it is going to be picked up and grabbed onto by the hemoglobin. But the hemoglobin has to release it back into the plasma to exchange with the tissue on this side. So a big take home picture here, exchange occurs with the plasma, oxygen is picked up out of the plasma associated with hemoglobin for the rest of the transport process through the rest of the circulation. What about the CO2? Do I have time? Maybe I don't have time. One minute. We'll pick up with CO2 transport, carbon dioxide transport, when I see it again on Wednesday. And always remember, oxygen goes in, CO2 goes out. Mm-hmm.